Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, uh, thanks for the organizers for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be in uh, Trieste. I enjoy the, the city uh, a lot, and I have to say that I've, I arrived yesterday and I had already the opportunity to drink some of your uh, famous coffee, so I enjoyed that very much. So I have to start with a disclaimer. So the title of this uh, talk was given to me by the organizers, so I have no choice than to talk about these things. And it's very much a project in progress, so you will not get a uh, end point story, but I, I try to give you an overview of how far we are. So as we know, the clinical phenotype of frontal temporal dementia is actually part of a kind of a spectrum. There, it goes on one side to ALS, on the other side to progressive supranuclear palsy. But what is quite interesting, if you look at the genes that have been identified for, for FTD and these uh, spectrum disorders, what you can, can actually see is that these genes very well predict what type of pathology you will have. So certain genes lead to FTLD with TDP pathology and other genes will lead to a tau pathology and some genes will lead to FAS pathology. So the correlation between genetics and, and the patholo neuropathological findings that you see is, very, is actually quite close. But we, we were quite intrigued by if this spectrum can be expanded and, and basically if we can make more sense of what is going on in the different types of FTD. So to do that, we thought that it's, it might be good to actually have a kind of systematic molecular characterization of the different types of FTD. And in the way we, would, we wanted to do this is, is that to use what we, have, what we know from genetics and actually from the most frequent genes that we have been found, the mutations in the tau gene, uh, C9 ORV and granulin, and also identify new genes and basically see if we can correlate this with pathological findings in, in, uh, in human brain, but also uh, looking at molecular characterization of model systems like transgenic mouse models and uh, IPS neurons from patients. The idea behind it is to do a kind of multi-genomic characterization. So we do genetics by sequencing uh, approaches of patient samples, but also then from these three systems, perform transcriptomics, epi epigenetic uh, analysis, and proteomics analysis. And with the end goal, if we can identify common and distinct molecular pathways disrupted in the subgroups of patients. Let's see how this works. Yeah. So the remote consortium, uh, as was said, is a European-funded consortium by the JPND program of uh, FP7. And it consists of people from different countries that I've listed here. And Quite a number of them are here in the audience. And we divided the work into three package, work packages. Work package one was to try to identify additional genes that cause FTD. Work package two was this genomic characterization of human, mouse, and IPS neurons. And work package three was more into the functional validation and eventually maybe even target discovery. I'm going a bit too fast. So if we look back at what we know about the genetics of FTD, uh, on family-based studies, we found a number of genes. Uh, I mentioned earlier the three most frequently mutated genes are the tau gene, granulin, and C9-ORF, but also other genes that are listed here are infrequent causes of the disease. If you look more in cohort-based studies, a number of genetic risk factors have been identified as well. Although I have to say here we are still in a relatively early stage. Other diseases actually are much more advanced than FTD. But a couple of interesting gene risk loads I have been identified. Still, only a minority of patients can be explained. Even a minority of familial cases can be explained by these mutations. So there is a room to identify more genes that can, can serve as a nice starting point for understanding the pathogenesis. So a couple of years ago, Matthias Sinovcik, who is a neurologist in Tübingen, uh, started collecting patients with frontal temporal dementia. And uh, earlier this year, we uh, published basically our first genetic characterization of this cohort, which consisted of 125 index cases. And basically what we looked was like, can we identify mutations in known genes for FTD in this cohort? What is the frequency of these mutations? And can we identify novel genes in here? So as you can see in this, uh, in this uh, graph, basically, we find actually a relatively large number of cases with uh, C9 ORF, uh, uh, hexanucleotide repeat expansions. We find some cases with granulin mutations. We do not find any mutations in the tau gene, but we find also every now and then a mutation in a number of other genes. 
Some of these genes are very often associated already with FTD. Other genes are maybe less obvious to be causing FTD. And what you see, for example, if we think at uh, like presenilin 1, presenilin 2, this is clinical FTD. Of course, if you go further in the disease, it becomes more clear that this is not a typical FTD. But if you are early in the disease, uh, you see often that there is a, a, a diagnosis that later has to be adjusted. So all in all, it's not... 20%, but uh, a bit, little, little bit less than 20% of the patients that were collected can be explained by very likely pathogenic mutations. So we then thought, of course, 125 samples is, of course, uh, not a lot. So if we look at the partners that are uh, available in the remote uh, consortium, can we have additional families or patients? So all the cases where we did not find the mutation in, in, in Tübingen were included, but we also included patients from the UK, the Netherlands, France, Italy. So all from the uh, partners in remote. So we collected these patients, roughly in, we had 260 uh, cases, and what we did was we performed whole exome sequences, se sequencing on these cases. So because we do not really have the family, but usually only single cases, Proving that a mutation is pathogenic is not always easy. You cannot look at co-segregation with the disease in the family, so you can only predict if a mutation is likely to be pathogenic, and then hopefully it makes some kind of biological sense. So what you can do is that you find mutations. What we found was actually an, a large number of very rare mutations. Very often it's only just one or two cases that carry a mutation. But if you do like a, a burden analysis, so you kind of add up all the variants within a gene, then a couple of genes popped up that were quite interesting. So these are genes that basically, in a, a burden test, so an association analysis on a number of variants, show that there is an increased risk of people carrying these variants to develop the disease. Of course, you can follow up these, uh, these genes. Um, I just give you one example of uh, one of the genes that we think is of interest is the exosome component 9. It's a, a component of the RNA exosome complex, and it plays a role in, in binding and presenting RNA for degradation. It binds, actually, to another protein called SCTX, which is a helicase, or it's predicted to be a helicase, and mutations in these genes are associated with ALS4 or a uh, ocular form of ataxia. So when you give stress to the cells that stops transcription, it co-localizes with SCTX and forms distinct foci. So we think that this is an important, or this might be an interesting candidate gene to follow up in more detail. And in fact, some of the early experiments we have been doing with Emanuela uh, here locally, at this moment, not yet convincing results, but we are working on this together. Apart from that, so we really thought we need larger cohorts to really get statistical power to, to do something, because based on just genetic data analysis, we could not prove that the gene was important. So our, our organization for which we work, DZ&E, uh, decided to form a clinical cohort, which grows by roughly 200 cases per year. It started only this year. And cases will be uh, re-examined uh, every other year, and, and, and basically so we get longitudinal data. So for us, at this moment, what is most interesting is that these cases are selected for genetic characterization, and there is also in development a, a neuropathology and donor program led by uh, Manuela Neumann, and where we do some sequencing in collaboration with Rosa Rademakers in the U.S. If brains become available, we would like to create also a transcriptomic epigenetic and proteomic data set that we do in collaboration with Remote FTD and another project that we're involved in, the NOMIS project. In the end, what we would like to do is to integrate these data into a platform that is basically usable for every type of researcher. Clinical researchers, uh, molecular researchers, any type of researcher should be able to mine these data and try to answer questions that they have. To increase further the number of patients that we would have sequencing data on, uh, we talked with the Genvi Consortium, of which Tübingen is part, and it turned out that a number of sites participating in Genvi have familial FTD cases without mutations in the three known genes, uh, C9-ORF, granulin, and tau. And actually, Genvi aims to extend patient selection with additional genes, and so we, uh, we asked basically the participants in Genvi, if you have families where you have not done let's say, an extensive genetic characterization, 
present them to us. We will characterize them. We will provide you with the data. You can, of course, publish on the data, but we would appreciate if we could use the data then later in this kind of consortium analysis. So by now we have a little bit more than these 260 uh, exomes in-house. We have from the data DNA clinical cohort that started this year 81 cases where we did exome sequencing. We have 57 from GenFi, so familiar cases. And with collaborators elsewhere in the world, uh, we've, collect, we've collected uh, data on approximately another 1,000 uh, cases. So in this case, we can jointly reanalyze the data and also look for replication in other data sets. That is the status where we are right now. I can give you, for example, for some of the genes we found in our, our initial data set, we talked with Rosa Rademakers and we looked at her data, and she was uh, uh, nice enough to look it up for us, and we found in some of the genes that we identified in our uh, original uh, data set, she found in some cases also variants there providing additional evidence that these genes indeed might be important for causing the disease. So to come back to this, genomic data set we were talking about. So we just talked about that we do a lot of exome and whole genome sequencing, and then we wanted to build a kind of data warehouse, let's call it like that, on all kind of omics uh, uh, characterization of human postmortem brain, human mouse models for FTD, and human IPS lines that were derived from patients. So basically, we follow a, a standard approach. For all of them, we do transcriptomics using a couple of techniques. Cage sequencing to really find transcription start sites, the classic RNA-seq, and sequencing small RNAs in microRNA-seq. We perform epigenomic analysis by performing chip-seq on a number of epigenetic marks and performing methylation analysis. And last, lastly, we perform quantitative proteomics. So these things, all these data sets, are being combined, and what we hope to build is, is gene expression models. So if we have a variant somewhere, how does it influence transcriptomic? Is this by epigenomic marks? How does it affect, basically, also protein expression? We try to find the molecular pathways that are involved, and we try to validate these things by performing high-throughput cellular screens. This is a lot of data, and I can tell you, it's a lot of data. And so the question is, how do you make it available for other people to mine it? So this we do in another project, which is called IDSN, which is Integrative Data Sem Semantics and Neurodegeneration. So it's a, it's a project that we do with the Fraunhofer uh, uh, Institute in, uh, in Germany. And what we do there is there we put all our genomic data in one kind of box. There is uh, other data like cellular screens in a second box. There is all the clinical patient information in a third box. And what they do is they basically uh, use text mining uh, tools and other tools to really search these data, and they collect it in what we would call a integration platform. They also integrate public databases, literature, and in the end, of course, the idea is that everybody, whether you're a specialist or not a specialist, would be able to ask questions to the system and obtain an answer. Okay, if my patient is doing this and this, or it has this and this phenotype, is anything has anything like that been seen before, and is this correlated with some molecular findings? Or your molecular uh, person can say, well, I have a gene that is differentially expressed in my system. Can I find anything back that is of any clinical relevance? So it would be a system that can be mined by everybody. So I can say the tools are there, the front end not yet. So that is what is going to be built in the next uh, one and a half year. So let's go to some of this uh, genomic data. So we have human postmortem brain samples. So we collected uh, 71 human brains with uh, uh, mutations in, uh, in, in either C9 or of tau or granulin, and uh, collected material from seven oops, collected material from seven regions of each brain for as much as possible. Uh, for example, for DNA, for RNA analysis, we had to select, for, of course, for RNA materials. So we found, actually, we had quite a number of, uh, uh, mat quite a lot of material for frontal and temporal rope, but for some of the other regions of the brain, the RNA was simply not of high enough quality to be used, so the data, the, the numbers of samples is less. All these brains are used for the different techniques, 
RNA sequencing, uh, epigenetics, and proteomics so that we have a, a relatively complete data set from each individual human brain. The matching mouse and IPS models is still ongoing, so the human brain data collection is, is more or less finished. The mouse models are uh, on their way, so we have mouse models for uh, the tau p 31 l mutation overexpression. We have a GRN uh, knockout mouse, and for C9 or 72, right now we have a lentiviral knockdown model, and the last model, a buck transgenic with an expanded repeat, is still being bred in the, uh, in the mouse facility to be able to isolate the brain. For the patient-derived cell lines, we use three uh, time points of, differential, of neuronal differentiation. We have 23 lines that we culture, so that for each of the mutation groups we have at least five, and uh, we characterize them in the same way as we do the mouse and the human brain. So what you can do, of course, afterwards, you can look at differentially expressed transcripts between the groups. So here we see the data on temporal lobe, frontal lobe. We see that there is overlap for many genes that are differentially expressed in, for example, tau and grandolin, that are then not differ uh, different in, in C9 North cases, but we also see genes that are misregulated in all of them and some genes that are specific for one group. You can do the same for other brain regions like the frontal lobe, and in this way you can create a number of gene sets that are uh, of interest for further investigation. You can then uh, do uh, basically analysis in, uh, for gene ontology and uh, CAT processes and see which processes are being altered by these genes and, uh, if, in order to be able to investigate them further. So let me give you a bit of an example for this. For example, if you have a number of genes that are differentially expressed, you can look in a, a molecular pathway analysis uh, program like Ingenuity or David, and you can really see if I have a pathway, is it differentially regulated in, in uh, the different uh, groups? And I hope you can see it. So we have three colors for basically tau, granulin, and c 9 orf In some cases, you see that the pathway is affected in, in two of the groups or even sometimes three of the groups. And in others, you really see that it's only affected maybe in one of the groups. So some of the processes are affected in one group of patients. Others are affected in more groups of patients. And in a way, you can build a heat map for this looking at all the kind of molecular pathways and say, well, for synaptic long-term potentiation, basically all the samples are kind of behaving the same. It's all decreased, which is logical. There is a loss of cells. But in some cases, you see actually that some of the pathways are upregulated in, in some of the groups, but not in all of the groups. So you can kind of think about which of the pathways are worth investigating further. You can do this in more detail and in, in really also also see so which of the genes in those pathways are upregulated. So you can really see these are the ones that are misregulated and somehow they are steering the, the whole pathway towards one direction. And if you really uh, look at it in more detail, you can really see, okay, for some of these pathways, there are nine genes that are up or down regulated. For others, there are even 29. So you know really which ones are misregulated and this can help you to understand the pathway. So this is where we are at this moment at the data collection. And of course, the question now is, this is all nice. You, uh, it's kind of a descriptive thing. It's a data resource. So you find a lot of data, and this will allow you to build hypotheses that then can be tested. And so that would be the next step. And this is only in a very early stage in the remote project. But one of the ways to do it, apart from making animal models, would be to test it in cell models. And I'm only going to talk about these things because uh, actually, I assume that maybe some of the other participants who work on other models will talk more about those. So, for example, from, from oops, from, oh, it's a challenging, uh, this, uh, so for, for some of the uh, genes that we find in our pathway analysis, of course, we would like to know how important they are in the pathway and whether their, the, basically their role in the pathway can be mimicked by uh, modifying some of the other genes in the pathway to really study how the pathway leads to a specific phenotype or maybe even to multiple phenotypes. So I've drawn up a diagram of how that would work. We have a gene that are, is of interest. So the first thing we can do, for example, is to what we call perturbate that gene. So we can, for example, do that by knocking it down or knocking it out and then see what kind of effect this has on the whole pathway and in the end on phenotypes that we consider important. So you have to develop 
assays to measure these phenotypes. This can be microscopic assays or can be genomic assays. You can perform a series of knockdowns on a series of genes of interest. You can perform confirmation experiments or validation experiments. And you can do that, for example, also in primary cells like neurons or glia cells, whatever you wish. If you basically can validate what you found interesting, you can perform rescue and complementation experiments, and you can even do multiple knockdowns or overexpressions at the same time. And this will help you to describe the full functional pathway and the role of the genes that you identified in your genetic or transcriptomic studies in these pathways. So how do we do this? We'll not talk in detail, but we've built an automated system to do this that basically handles all our cell culture. The cells are incubated in a CO2 incubator. There's a robotic arm here that basically can help you to bring your cells to either a fluorescent microscope or in the backside a confocal microscope. We have a freezer next to it which contains our short hairpins, RNA, our compounds. So you can do all your transfections on the deck of the robot and basically you can culture your cells and do your perturbations in a very large scale. So I'll give you an example of how this works. Part of the genetic work is also, of course, looking at uh, genome-wide association studies. So for FTD, there are a few, but there is just a limited number of loci where basically there is some evidence that there must be a risk gene underneath the peak. Under these peaks, there is not just one gene. There is a number of genes. There are protein coding genes. There are antisense transcripts, there are non-coding RNAs, etc., etc. So when we find an association, we do not know what the actually the causal SNP actually influences. Is it a protein coding gene? Is it a non-coding RNA? Or what is it? So basically to investigate this, what we do is we select all the genes under the peaks and perform an assay to see if any of them does anything that is related to the disease that we are interested in. So, for example, we investigate uh, TDP43, where we know that uh, it's normally a nuclear protein, but if you uh, basically uh, hit the cells with a stressor or whatever, very often what you see is that TDP43 also moves to the cytoplasm. And so we consider this an, an, uh, an, an important assay for TDP function, and so we can measure this under the microscope. And what we can do is basically perform short hairpin uh, knockdowns. Uh, we, can do a, we can do a large number at the same time and see which one of the genes that are under these GWAS peaks actually influence this TDP43 phenotype. So if we do this on all the load side, we get the number of hits. And we get hits for almost all the load side that we found, except for three but this is a locus that contains HLA, which is basically not expressed in the cells that we work with. But we also find basically hits with TMEM 106B, C9 orf first and granulin. So I would consider these positive controls. So in a way, what we've done in this way is to look at all the genes under the GWAS peak and find a possible, well, additional evidence for possible candidates under this peak, which of these genes are actually possibly important in increasing the risk for the disease. So, in summary, so for REMOT in World Package 1, we generated a large whole exome sequencing data set. We also now have access to a relatively large replication set, so we can replicate the identified candidate genes in these additional data sets. For World Package 2, we've created this multi-omics data set, at least for the human. Uh, we've done a differential expression analysis and a, a wg and &E analysis, so weighted gene co-expression network analysis. Data integration is in process, and the human data can be used to investigate the candidate genes that we identified in work package one. Data generation from the mouse models and the IPS is in progress, and for work package three, we've performed the first cellular screen, and we've done, let's say, uh, of, we are in the planning of doing a gene network analysis based on work package one and two identified candidate genes and test them in this cellular system. And I want to end with the people who are doing all the work. Obviously, uh, my own laboratory where we have people that are involved in the cellular screening, people involved in the data analysis and in the IPS cultures. Um, of course, the remote consortium itself 
uh, that have been uh, uh, helping to generate all these data that we try to make available for, for the community as, as, as quickly as possible. Um, there is too much to follow up, so in this sense it's also an invitation for people to, uh, to, to come to us and, and see if there are possibilities for collaboration, because we will have too many things to follow up in any case. I want to thank Matus Sinovcik and Manuela from Dejsdane Tübingen for their help in the project and Rosa Rademakers from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville for, uh, for her collaboration. And finally, I have to thank the Netherlands Brain Bank for, for most of the brain samples that we obtained and our funding agencies that make this work possible. <laughs>